Good morning. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, coming off that high from the Ken Billington interview. And you are listening to Light Talk. Hi, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. And today we are discussing Lico's focus calls, consoles, and we're going back to high school on Light Talk. Going back to high school. Two weeks in a row we're going back to high school. I got lift back twice? Oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to go back to high school, but this is Anne, <laughs> and I'm in San Clemente, <laughs> California. You know, we should just talk about our high schools, but... Oh, no. <laughs> or junior high school, as the case may or be. Or middle school, but that's enough. Hey, right. this is David in Long Beach, California, and if you don't already know by our blabbering, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Bro System. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so anyway, welcome to episode 121. And uh, Stan mentioned it at the top, but we are sort of in our Ken Billington afterglow. <laughs> and I must say, I, again, this is just my opinion. I don't know if my brothers and sister actually agree with it, but that may have been the best show we've ever done. This was a good yeah. show. That yeah, was a top. It's in the it's in the legends of light of Lumen Legends category. Well, it was a legend show, right? Because we it was, it was legendary light. But it was a great interview. We've gotten great feedback. We've gotten a ton of downloads. A lot of people are listening to it, and uh, a lot of people are sa- telling us that it was great. So I guess it was pretty good. Well, he had fun, right? I mean, that's the that's the thing, right? Yeah, he had a he, good he time. Had a, he had a great time. He had a terrific time, and you know, but he always seems to have a good time in the theater. That's at true. least the That's what makes him Ken Billington. Well, there you go. Anyway, uh, you know, we're so happy to have Anne on the show because she originally wanted to be on that interview show, but we couldn't work out the schedule. Uh, I think Anne, where you were working or you're at school or I something was, in was going tech. on. Such a bummer. I really yeah. wanted to be there. Yeah, yeah, because Anne, as we all know, is very close with uh, Ken. Uh, she worked with him for a year or so, or mm-hmm. maybe more yeah two years over two years mm-hmm. so yeah and he even mentioned Anne in the interview it was lovely he, <laughs> I know. Said, he, he was like giving you props for your book oh my gosh I about fell on the floor when he said that it's like he does so many things I can't believe he remembered <laughs> one of the things we wanted to give Anne the opportunity to do since she wasn't able to be on the show was to just give us a few words uh, a summary of how she felt about the interview so what do you think Anne oh, it was just You know, it's just always amazing to hear him talk. Like, you know, first of all, my career would not exist without Ken Billington. You know, he and Ben Piercy took pity on a girl out of grad school at one point. (laughs) (laughs) And I got the job in his office, you know, three days before I graduated grad school and felt like the luckiest person on the universe. Mm. And, um, you know, I was doing things like watering plants and answering phones and ordering office supplies. You know, it was like (laughs) anything to be close to the king. Right. And um, um, he was so good to me and he'd let me, you know, bring his mail to the theater. So I'd hang out as sort of an intern, which you're not supposed to do um, on Broadway. And, uh, you know, I didn't do any paperwork, so there's nothing wrong going on. But like just observing his work, you know, and um, get him coffee whenever he well, he doesn't really drink coffee, but whatever he needed to drink or eat that time at that time. And it was just, you know, as a budding lighting designer right out of school, the most amazing, incredible position I could ever be in. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, and he did, he did mention my book, which I, like I said, I just felt like my knees went weak that he remembers that I even wrote that. Like, he's just so busy. And uh, he wrote my foreword for that book, which is, you know, a blessing. And just, I just can never believe how lucky I am that he even gives me the time of day because he's just so busy. Not because he's, you know, he's the sweetest guy ever. Um, But I don't know. I just he said that about my book with, you know, it might influence more people than he would, which is funny, like I said, because, you know, really like he mentioned the family tree, the Billington family tree. Yeah, I had my students do that exercise at one point. And uh, we did it with all, you know, a bunch of Broadway people. But Billington was a huge component of that family tree. And it was quite incredible where all of it was trickling down. And my book is really his work. Like, you know, it's uh, my work is so influenced by his work that I make no um, um, like I'm not shy to say that a lot of the work in there is what I learned at Billington's and how, you know, because I learned it at Billington's, that means many, many other people on Broadway are doing it that way as well. And so it's become sort of the gold standard of how you do Broadway paperwork. And so I'm pretty much just the one that wrote it down, you know? Right. Thank <laughs> it's, God. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, 
you know, the Greeks and, you know, when the Greeks, the ancient Greeks started writing down theater, it was like, well, they'd been doing it forever. But like somebody just one at one point, Aristotle, I think, sit da- sat down and wrote it down. And that's kind of how I feel about um, his influence on my work and on that book particularly. So, yeah, I just thought that was really special. And um, God, what an incredible interview. Like uh, Stan and I were talking offline and he said, you know, he'd heard things in that interview that he'd never heard Ken say before. And I feel the same way. Like, uh, I'd never heard the gingerbread man story, <laughs> which is amazing. The 60 right? amp knife switch. Yeah. Blackout. I, I, that's where he got that idea for uh, Sue and E. Todd. Right. Used, uh, we got to do a blackout right after the organ. Yeah, that 60 amp <laughs> knife switch comes down. Boom. Yeah. Memories from gingerbread time. Yeah. You know, Anne, I, I wanted to say something that you were talking about with your book, and, and you just wrote it down, and, you know, like the people of the book. But he also said something about, the generosity of designers and the sharing and how he was he got this thing to do this version of chorus line mm. after Natasha uh, had revived yeah. it and he just called her up and she said well, I'll just send you everything I have and I think that's something really beautiful about the nature of our business mm-hmm. we're all at least most of us anyway I can't speak for everyone is, is really generous with their knowledge that's sort of what this show is about too and so this I don't know if that's true in other industries but and, and I think it's probably because of people like Ken and the influence that they have, that radiates out. That we, it's the culture that he helped create in a larger sense. It's really quite, quite. You wonderful. know, I don't think a brain surgeon would take a 19-year-old guy <laughs> or gal who's never no, has know nothing about brain surgery and drag them into the uh, operating room. Right? I don't think you'll be seeing that. Uh, but that's a very good point, Stan. And it is generosity. Talk about the generosity. Yeah, of Theron, when Theron basically, yeah. you know, said, right. yeah, you may not know how to be an assistant, but you're going to learn right now. Same thing with Gilbert and me. I mean, it's like, we're, we're going to teach you how to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it influences me even to this day. I got recently got connected to a, a young man in Bangkok who wants to come study with me. And he's a he's an actor, musical theater guy who now wants to be a line designer. Mm-hmm. And I sent him all this stuff, links to Anne's book, all, I mean, all this information. Mm-hmm. And I thought, if you're really into it, I'll be hearing from you within three days. If you're not, you're just fooling me. <laughs> and the guy is like sitting in front of Vectorworks now sending me pictures of his work. And okay, so he's really motivated. Awesome. But I'm taking my time. He may not be at my program, but that ethic is very, I feel like that's sort of what Ken has given a lot of us in terms of the way that we respond to, to the world. So Steve, what, what was your favorite part of the interview? Well, I'm a, a big fan of the gingerbread story myself. <laughs> I, th- I think it's, it's interesting that... Uh, if you, if you kind of look at that, um, his theater teacher's decision to kind of scold him, yeah. uh, put him in a direction, a trajectory that he might not have gone on. Interesting. You know, yeah. she, to, she, she told him to go sit down. Yeah. If you can't, if you can't behave yourself, <laughs> go sit down in the wings. So, but he, f- he found this niche. It's very interesting. You know, he also talked about, we talked about generosity, about that, that boy that he met who wanted to get into the theater and he yeah. told him that he should be an usher. And then about mm-hmm. 20, 30 years later, he's on the phone saying that he's now the general director of this theater company <laughs> and thanking right. him. That's just a beautiful thing. And then the, the final thing I just wanted to mention was the, the thing he said about no matter what the show is, you still do your best work. Even though you know, you know the show is going to be a failure or you know it's not going to make it to Broadway or it may not have a lot of money, you still do your best work because you're there. Mm-hmm. And you always yep. have that, that standard. You always keep your standard of quality and professionalism there. That was very, very good and very important. Absolutely. I totally believe in that. I pass that on to my students. I'm like, it doesn't matter if you're making $0 or $50 or $50,000. Like you draft the same way. You do the same quality of design. You are still nice to who's ever in charge. Like all that stuff. It doesn't matter what you're getting paid. That's your work and your calling card. That's what gets remembered. Yeah, and I think, you know, some of that might be passed down from the grandmothers of our industry too. Like if he's learning from Theron, like, you know, it was a time when... And as a woman, you couldn't go in there and throw a fit because no way would you get your foot in the door, you know. And so they learned to kill it through kindness. And I think that just was passed down through all the generations. And thank goodness, because that makes it such a wonderful industry. Agreed. 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 So anyway, we, if you haven't listened to the uh, interview, it's episode 120. It was just done last... Well, actually, we, it, we, the interview was way back in March, I believe, when we did it. It took... It took he agreed to it like two years ago when we first... He was going to be our first anniversary guest, and he couldn't make it because of scheduling. That's when we had Don Holder. So, so we've been talking to him for 
as long as Light Talk has been on the air about the interview. Right, but the interview was taped back in March. And yeah. uh, and because uh, I was in uh, where was I? I was someplace in Florida, South Carolina, yeah, South Carolina, Carolina. Myrtle oh, Beach. What the hell was I doing in Myrtle Beach? But anyway, <laughs> uh, that's where family I was. Thing. You were doing a oh, that's right. Thing. I went. Yeah. It was the cousins thing, right? It was great. But uh, yeah, so the dates may be off, but we had to wait for a couple of uh, months. So anyway, if you haven't heard it, go listen to it. It's fantastic. And you'll worth the wait. It was worth, worth it was the worth the wait. Absolutely. I just want to thank the three of you for getting him on the show. You know, just anything we can like record of his wisdom and pass on Absolutely. is incredible. So thank you for doing that for everybody. Well, it's our pleasure. I mean, he was like, it was so funny when we were talking about doing the show, we were talking about, Hey, we'll, we'll bring some people on, you know, and I know some people, we all know people. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first guest we had was Josh, Josh White. I had just interviewed Josh for something else um, a few months uh, earlier, and I knew he'd be a great interview because you never know, you know, when you interview somebody, if you don't know them personally or you haven't heard an interview that they've done, Mm -hmm. it's a gamble. I mean, some people could be terrible interviews. And uh, I knew that Josh was going to be an automatic, and he was. And I also knew that Ken would be. But we again, we were trying to get Ken on for that first anniversary show. He was just so busy. I mean, we were trying to figure out times and all that. And we just couldn't do it. And uh, so we, we delayed it a year. And now that's where we are now. So, yeah. And I must say that uh, we, we've been very lucky with our interviews because they, they're been. all great. You know, I'm, all these people are terrific. So thank God. I think we're booked up, Steve. Right? Aren't we booked till the end of the end of 19 with interviews? Is yeah, we're right? start we're starting to recruit people now for season four. Wow, season four. Wow. All right, season <laughs> four. I just can't believe I heard those words. <laughs> um, oh my god! All right, so let's get started with the show today. That was great, Anne. And thank you for being on the show today and giving us your yeah, amazing okay. reactions to that because we know how close you are to Ken and to his office and to his work. So uh, I'm so happy that you had a chance to to be be involved. Yeah, me too. You know, it's one of those things. I tell my students they cannot graduate if they don't know who Ken Billington is. Oh, my God. <laughs> At the very least. And Theron, actually. <laughs> yeah, forget it. They, they can't even get, step into the classroom if they, they right. don't learn. Okay, so, hey, amazingly, Anne has our first question today. I sure do. And it's from California. Look at that. Hey. Hey. So Tracy in beautiful California, wherever she is, says, I am in college and about to focus my first black box show of 37 lights. Congratulations, Tracy. Very cool. Um, Can you suggest a focusing strategy? All right. Well, Tracy, let's see. Um, For me, it's no different focusing a black box than it is a proscenium or an arena or anything else. And the key is, well, I guess one thing I don't know is whether you designed the light plot or not. Because if you designed the light plot, then you probably know where each of those lights should focus. If you didn't design the light plot, then that's a little trickier. So let's start with if you designed the lights. So if you designed the light plot, when you placed each light, you probably knew, you know, you might have... uh, broken the areas into what we call lighting areas, you know, A through B, A through, what would we have, six or nine areas in a black box, typically something like that, depending on how big it is. So then what I do is I bring what I call focus tapes, which is, you could use a tape measure. You just lay out a tape measure, you know, at the center line and at the very downstage edge of a black box, usually, because there isn't a proscenium. And then whatever you did on your light plot where you laid out your lighting areas, that's where you would stand to focus the light. So there is a chance here, I'm thinking, because it's your first black box show and it's 37 lights, that maybe you did not do the light plot. And so if that's the case, and my brothers, I'm sure, have other things to say about this, but if that's the case, I'd try to figure out what the intention of that light plot was in the first place. Like there's probably different systems of light. And when we say systems of light, we're talking about they have the same angle, they have the same purpose, and typically the same color. So perhaps there's, you know, if there's maybe six 36s all pointed at the stage that are all no color or R33 or something like that, those might be your front lights. And so you know you need to divide the space up into six areas or whatever that is. Areas are usually 8 to 12 feet in diameter, so I think about 10 feet diameter circles, and they overlap a little bit. But you would stand at each one of those and try to even out um, the focus. And then basically just cover the space as much as you can with a little bit of overlap in the lights. And then um, cut off, (laughs) I don't know how to say it better than like, 
<clears throat> cut off things that are ugly or distracting. <laughs> so if you have like, you know, a really ugly, I don't know, wall on one side. It's a thrust. It could be an ugly audience member. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> or a good looking one. <laughs> yeah. And that goes in the category of distracting, right? You want to <laughs> you want to cut off of the audience. We're not blinding them. So maybe you cut it to their laps is usually what I do. So it's just, it's not any different for me than another space, but there are things to think about, like keeping off of the audience so you're not blinding their eyes. Um, and there are some different like designing techniques, but that's a whole other different topic. But I have talked enough. Let's see what my brothers think. How about David? What do you think? Uh, what do I think um, about black box? Yeah. I, you know, I don't think it matters whether you're doing a black box or if you're doing a proscenium. Uh, focusing strategy will depend on the show. Mm -hmm. Because there may be shows that you'll do in this black box that will only require like four or five lights. You, know, you say 37, a lot of people say, oh my God, how can someone, you know, design with only 37 lights? But actually in a black box, especially in a black box, uh, if it's a smaller black box, that's a very intimate space. Mm -hmm. And you can get away with a lot more in a small black box than you can in a proscenium stage where the closest audience member is 20 feet away. So I, I just think that it's a black box actually offers you a lot more flexibility. So if, you know, if you do all the areas and all that, yeah, that's, that's great. Those are what we call gamuts, get me out of trouble lights or, or <laughs> fill light. But I would start with just your key lights for each scene. Just focus your key lights and whatever you have left, then do washes to fill in the light. But, you know, just again, break everything down to scenes, to moments, what is the key light? Like Ken said last last week, you know, and I said before, what's the most important light? That's your key light. And what do you do with that key light? You take it to... Oh! oh. <laughs> and then see what else you need. That's what right. What do you need that You may much? not need anything right. else. I mean, that light may bounce and create fill light. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and again, it's not going to look like... And, and this is the big mistake that I've heard a lot of people say, you know, like, oh, I want it to look the same from every direction. It's well, not. That's absurd. And yeah. if you do that's that, absurd. you can actually do that, but it's going to look like crap. Because, <laughs> it's like science yeah, lighting. Get, That's like, you might as well get some fluorescence out. Get some fluorescence out, you know? Uniformity. I have, I have one thought I would just throw in there. You guys sort of hit on it. Um, what's the arrangement of the, like David says, the show? We have a large black box where I work. It's like 60 by 60. But every scenic designer seems to want a different seating arrangement. So I think if you're in the round, it's one approach. If you're in a proscenium or an end stage, that's another approach. If you're in a three-quarter, like David said, a thrust. So in terms of what Anne is talking about, you know, it, it matters what the scenic designer gave you and what the arrangement is to, in terms of strategy, I think. Well, I'm going to go back again to the question here, and it says my first black box show. So I'm going to assume you've designed it. I think when you're focusing your first show, you know, it's nice if you're organized if you come into the space and you, you've, you've spoken with the people who are going to focus your show about what you're trying to accomplish, and if you're a little nervous, which I would be, uh, do something easy. Focus the special on the chair. Focus the special on the refrigerator. Do something that you're going to succeed at right off the bat. Because sometimes it's difficult to get an even wash on the stage. Sometimes you got to focus it three and four times. So start with the stuff that's really easy, kind of get warmed up, get a relaxed atmosphere going with your crew, and just work through it slowly and efficiently. And if you see something you don't like, go ahead and change it right then. If the light needs to move a couple feet to the left to focus on that chair, go ahead and move it right now. If that blue is a little too dark, Go ahead and put a lighter shade of blue in. So I would say take your time and just enjoy your very first show. Yeah. And Steve, I'm so glad you mentioned nervous because, Tracy, if you're nervous, that's very common. You know, and I don't know about my brothers here, but I am absolutely nervous at every focus. <laughs> Sure. Still, I'm to this excited. Day. I'm like, is that gonna work? Yeah, is it not that's what, work? that's when you know if you did the light plot, quote, you know, quote unquote, right or not, you know, yeah. and you see if it's gonna work or not. And so I'm always, you know, not sleeping the night before a focus. So if you're a little nervous, don't even worry about it. It's just part of the process. <laughs> well, and you're also talking about when you go to focus. Is this the show 
that everyone's going to figure out you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> is, yeah. is, is this is this the show they're going to catch? They're going to yeah. be exposed. This. Yes. Luckily, they never exposed do. as a fraud. <laughs> We're all hacks. That's what we are. We're all the imposters. Yeah, imposter syndrome. Isn't that true yeah. about all artists? They think they always say. Even the great artists will say, you know, I always kind of felt that guy was faking it. If you watch those recent interviews with Paul McCartney, <laughs> oh, yeah. where he says, "I'm I'm still not sure I'm good enough," like you're you're Sir Paul McCartney, oh, and he's still thinking he's not good yeah. enough. All right, Diane from New Smyrna Beach, Florida asks, how do you go about teaching your students a console? Well, I would say uh, start with, here's the console. This is how I plug it in. This is how I plug in DMX. Uh, And then show them how to patch. Start right there, something simple. And I have a light patched in, and now I'm going to show you how to turn that light on. And then I'm going to show you how to write a cue. So I think little baby bites, uh, you start out with the most simple stuff and their owner manuals, their manufacturers, their videos. But just start with, oh, by the way, there are two on switches on the board. (laughs) Um, And go there. I mean, and you're engaged in teaching students all the time. What, What do you guys do in California? Yeah, I think the trick is knowing the level of your student and not teaching too much at first. So, um, you know, I have undergrads in my lighting one class and I start them off with a project about, you know, almost towards the end of the semester called the musicals project. And I give them a musical to music, a piece from a musical to design. And then I take them to the board and I say, I, we have a rep plot in our little light lab with a, an ETC uh, element in there. And I say, OK, here's how you use the board. And I give them a cheat sheet that has like, I don't know, maybe seven or eight basic things on it. And it's like one at full enter, one plus two at full enter, you know, so it's literally, you know, stepping through the very, very basics. And here's how you save. And if you really want, you could turn on the moving lights, but you got to kind of teach yourself that, you know, so I, I don't overwhelm them at first. And I think that's the key. And I put them in groups so that kind of like what you said about different um, levels together, I put them in groups so they kind of learn off each other and they don't panic by themselves in the dark light lab. (laughs) And then um, more advanced students like um, in lighting two, we've got grad students and uh, high level undergrads. I give them a cueing project that's also a musical because that's me, but I do it through vision. So in those classes, we're learning Vectorworks Vision, which is a visualizer program. And so I have them build the light lab in vision, and then I have them cue in, you know, in vision using the Nomad console, you know, in their laptop or whatever it is. And um, then we take it, we cue it completely in vision, and then we take it to the light lab and they try it out in there too. So it's like the next step, like I have, I say like, well, now you must do a moving light fly out. Now you must do whatever, you know, so we talk through all those different things. And I do have them watch all of the different uh, ETC console videos that are out there in those classes. And then finally, um, I bring ETC in. They come to my school every year and every third year we do an advanced programming uh, two-day seminar. And so ETC walks them through a whole bunch of things and it's people of all different levels. And then they do a project based on that. So it's, you got to kind of, um, like uh, Steve said, sort of mini bites. You got to think about the level of your audience and how you're going to feed it to them. You know, one thing I want to say is that uh, if you want to do this by yourself, if you, if you don't belong to a school, uh, a lot of these companies will come to a larger city and do a group class. And I think it's really important. This is something that came up last week when CAST was talking about their training for black tracks. And uh, I did a little research, and they were announcing a training session, and they were charging $1,500 for that training session, which I think is a little outrageous, Um, especially for students. I think students, you know, they can't afford $1,500. Now, I looked at some of the other companies. I actually posted this on the uh, Facebook page is that they're reasonable, $300, $500, $400, you know, for a two-day session. That is reasonable. Uh, So I think the companies, that they really need to look at themselves, and the the smart ones are doing this. They're saying, these are our future customers. Hey, listen, this is why Verilite did it from the very beginning when I was at SMU. They were smart. They knew that if they got students trained on the artisan, they would be specking out Verilites. Mm -hmm. It's that simple, and it's true. That's what I did. They they went. I went through the artisan training. Believe it or not, uh, took Verilites apart to the screws and put them you back together. You ran a console. I ran 
wait a, a minute. Yes, I ran a console. But let me tell you something. The Artisan was a pretty simple console to run, let me tell you. But the point being is that smart companies will make it easy for students to learn the technology. I'm so glad you said that because ETC comes down to my place for free, but I've had other companies not do that. And I'm like, you don't understand. Like, these are your future customers, you know, and I'm always right. I'm always disappointed when that doesn't work out. So, like, it's such an easy marketing strategy. Like, it's do it. It's so easy. <laughs> and it's, it's good so, for us. So it's good for them. Like, yeah. <laughs> so the other thing, you know, this person who maybe is a student could do is take a look at LDI, yeah. And go out there for cons- some console training. Go, yeah. go, to, go to a convention every other year. Yeah. Take advantage of the classes. Some are paid, some are free. Right. And take a look at that. Absolutely. Yep. Great, great, great suggestions. Good point. Stan. All right. And uh, Stan, you have our next question. And this comes from the heartland. Uh, Mark in Iowa writes, can you discuss the real, and then he puts in parentheses, if any, and parentheses, benefits of LED technology? And then he says, please don't give me the ETC strand salesman talking points. Oh, what a question. Finally, he says, what ERSs do you recommend? Well, okay, I'll get this going and then you, this is going to be a free for all, I think. It's hard to kind of steer away from salesman talking points because there are advantages and disadvantages, but I'll try and be as objectively neutral as I can. So an LED ellipsoidal offers you a lot of flexibility. Right? It's just a lot of things you can do with it, more things than you could do with a traditional fixture. Color, for example, incredibly flexible. And not just picking a color, but fading from one color to another. Whites, there's just a lot of richness and layers in, what, in the color capabilities of an LED fixture. The other thing is obvious, so I'll just say it for you since you're asking, there's a longevity factor, right? These things are just going to last longer. It's I'm still using 10-year-old computers. I mean, there's a computer in there, there's LEDs, there's solid-state light sources in there, so there's a longevity factor that's an advantage. And if you're re-equipping a theater, which I do a lot of, it's a smaller inventory, right? You just don't need as many fixtures. On the downside is because it's a computer, Uh, essentially each fixture, they really will prefer a clean environment. So if you've got a very dirty work environment, computers don't like that. Electronics don't like dust because it creates a thermal blanket on top of PCBs. So depending upon the kind of environment you're in, that's a downside. You want to have a clean theater. Um, There's a high upfront cost, no question. The cost of an an LED fixture versus a tungsten fixture, you're just going to pay more. But you can rationalize, if you have the bank, you're offsetting uh, the expenditure down the road because of longevity and con- and a less consumption. Um, they do have a more complex user interface. You just have to get used to all the bells and whistles and modes and things that that fixture can do and how to patch it and all of that stuff. So there's, it's a more complex piece of technology. Um, and the other downside is weight. So they're definitely heavier. Um, so depending upon where you put it and how you're going to rig it and who's lifting it and how often you're lifting it, or if you have the capability to hold the stuff in the air, they are definitely a heavier item. So those are my goods and bads about it. In terms of fixtures, we have uh, I have most direct experience with the Luster line. I have direct experience with the Strand uh, Silicon uh, line, and I have direct experience with the Chevet line, all of which I think are fine products. Uh, there's a whole lot of other stuff out there as well. Uh, I have not, I am very uh, taken with the Martin product, uh, and we are specifying those on a project right now in Tampa. Although I have heard of some others that I haven't had my hands on that I hear really great things about. Yeah, the uh, Pro Lights Eclipse. Uh, Driscoll yeah. has uh, raved about this light. I have seen it. I've never seen it on, so I can't tell you about it. But from what I've heard, it's a lot less expensive than a lot of the competition. Just thinking as a designer, the benefit of LED is the color changing for me. You know, um, The disadvantage is that if you're in white, it's not as bright right. as a traditional Source 4, for example. Um, but you know, more saturate colors are brighter. So I'm still sort of working out those photometrics in my, in my head. Um, and as far as favorites, I'm sort of an ETC baby. So, um, you know, the, the luster plus series two is my favorite. And what I really love about it is the seven color system. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think one of the main reasons for that is I did a bunch of research into metamerism a year and a half ago or something when I was writing an article. And um, it was talking about, uh, or I was, the people I was talking about that are real color experts were talking about how it renders skin tone. And the fact that there's that cyan LED in there helps to render skin, which sounds sort of odd until you think about like skin actually has, you know, the blue veins and some people have sort of blue qualities to their skin. And, you know, there's all these different nuances to human skin that I think the seven colors really help with. So those are sort of my things. And, you know, the, uh, Speaking just of ETC, the color source is also nice light, um, but don't try to mix the two in a system. Like, don't think the seven color and the four color are going to be the same because they mix color in completely different ways. Well, I'm 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 not afraid, uh, and Anne isn't afraid. I'm going to go for Mark's answer. I I'm using the Martin ELP CLs. Mm-hmm. I I think they're fantastic lights, and I also really like the Strand SPX line, and I guarantee you. Every manufacturer is going to have something exciting at LDI. They're all, you pick them. They've all got stuff going on back in the warehouse behind locked doors that we don't know about. (laughs) And there's going to be some wonderful lights from everybody at uh, LDI this fall. So unless you're desperate to buy a light today, I, I would give it a couple months and see what the new stuff is that's coming out. But again, major manufacturer, you should have no worries with anybody. You are listening to Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers and Sister. Light Talk is sponsored by... As a busy theater professional, your days can be both long and hectic. Opening a new show, a book signing, stopping by the local university to lecture, or as you say, just another Tuesday keeps you on the run. This means you don't always have time for healthy meals. (laughs) Well... The good men and women at Pet Sweat of Japan have your back with three new tasty beverages. Just imagine, it's 6 a.m. and you have overslept. No time for (laughs) breakfast. You are late, my friend, but what to do? No need to panic. Just open the fridge and pull out pancake in a can. (laughs) Some genius dipped his fingers in the pancake batter bowl once too many times, and thus pancake in a can sprang forth. Skipping the griddle saves you serious time when thick, gooey batter in a can awaits. All that great flapjack taste without the nutrition. Use a spoon or just pour it on your hand. Yummy. Is it wrong if that sounds good? (laughs) Let's face it. You can't seem to kick that cigarette habit, but you can't light up on the subway. That would not be PC. What to do, kitten? Just reach into your backpack and pull out a warm can of tobacco shock. The shock refers to that lemon-lime flavor infusion. It also describes the reaction your gag reflex will have. Am I drinking rubbing alcohol mixed with a butt from an ashtray? (laughs) Why, yes, you are. But you don't give a damn because you're hooked. Finally, It's 3 p.m. and the mid-afternoon slump is hitting you hard. You don't have any energy and you can barely keep your eyes open. You need a nap, but no time for that. Mick Jagger's on the phone. (laughs) Just grab yourself a cold, refreshing can of poo honey water. The name (laughs) says it all, poo honey water. Return to your childhood and your beloved Winnie the Pooh. Remember his magical honey pot of delight? Now you have one too. Take a long, deep drink and enjoy the rich taste of artificial honey. (laughs) Not only that, but the sugar will give you that energy hit you need. Pet Sweat of Japan. Always something good in the kitchen for the busy designer. Wow. I'll take an order of one and three. I'm okay with that. (laughs) (laughs) And now... Back to Light Talk. (laughs) Well, those ducks you hear in the background tell us that once again, it's time for our (laughs) ever-popular Let's Talk About segment. And today, we were going to talk a little bit about texture and creating texture. This actually came from a question that was posted on our uh, Light Talk Facebook group about ways of creating texture on stage and gobos, dealing with gobos and things like that. But I don't know. Let's just open this up. We know that Anne loves gobos. I do. Right? She, and she's a <laughs> self-professed 
Gobo Attic. Yep. As a matter of fact, mm-hmm. you know, Theron used to wear a little medallion of of 869, which was a roscaline color, <laughs> around her neck because she used it brilliantly all the time. I didn't know that. And I didn't yes, know that. and and like a bunch of electric a bunch of electricians got together and gave her a good show gift, and it was a little medallion with a piece of 869 in it, oh, and she wore it quite a bit actually. For Anne has gigantic gobo earrings that she wears. <laughs> That's true. Sometimes there are three or four of them. You know, depending on her mood, you know, she she may have a construction breakup or she could mm-hmm. have like a, you know, a blob breakup. Mm-hmm. But anyway, okay. so Anne, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you use gobos for texture? Oh, well, I guess I'm like the pedantic answer, right? Because you're going to tell us all these amazing ways to do it without gobos. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Because <laughs> I use gobos He just too. uses dimmers. <laughs> I, I just dimmers. love them. You know, I love like the way that light with texture in it like dances over the human form like I love how it makes the form look like it's moving more than it actually is or jumping higher than it actually is like I love how it can make scenery do things that you've never imagined that it would from the initial viewing of it you know and usually it's beyond what you the lighting designer even expected right like you throw some gobo on and it's like oh my god it just looks incredible I didn't think it would look that good but thank goodness you know and um I just think it's it's a quality of light that we have the fortune of using in in lighting design because there's no other place that it's really used. Like, yes, you'd make maybe a custom gobo for architecture that's like the company logo or something. Like, that's the only thing I've ever done in architecture with a gobo. But in theater, it's a huge part of artistic expression. So for me, a show without gobos is sometimes necessary if it's a show that should be clean you know the script calls for a clean show but I'm always a little sad because I miss that like extra boost of interest that it does on stage you know and I love I do like when I lecture to my grad students it's like gobo-tastic like so much about (laughs) gobos like they they just want to like throw me out the window probably eventually because it's like you know I talk about how much I love like stretchy gobos for example versus like down gobos that look like puddles of light you know and um, I love sort of the the way you can manipulate them through overlapping the gobos because then you get various forms of of a look on a person and it could be something like moonscape which is blobby along with like um uh brush, what is it called? Like, breakup yeah like brush <laughs> or like a, a, a stripey thing you know so i can't think of a good name right alpha now, rays so, alpha rays yeah that's yes stripey. but that idea yeah so you get like two feelings of quality on the person and so i just think um one of the things that new young lighting designers do is they go "Ooh, gobos are cool and i remember that day when i was like oh my god a gobo is the best thing ever i've never seen anything like it but what they don't know is that it's not like you you know you're doing a forest you have to use the forest gobo and you know it's like it's not a paint by number kit it's an artist's uh, studio you know where you can use it in so many different ways and you can combine them on top of each other in the same fixture and you can use gobo tape if you can still find it um, to like create different things on the gobo you can alternate the window that you got you know all these different things so it's a really exciting paintbrush for me um, so yeah, I guess I'm the one that can talk about using it like normally, quote unquote, versus I'm excited about all the stuff you shared online, David, and I'm excited to hear more. So, well, I, I just want to make it known that I do use gobos. I love gobos. Uh, I found that early in my career, I used a lot of gobos and I think my aesthetic has changed. Mm. And a lot of it was from <laughs> bad directors saying, Oh, you know that big flat piece of scenery right there? Why don't you throw a leaf gobo on it? Mm. It'll make it look mm. better. No, it won't. <laughs> <laughs> I do have some gobos I'm allergic to like that. <laughs> <laughs> and what's worse is when you do it and the director says, oh, it looks fantastic and it looks like crap. You know, oh, I was like, no, it looks yes. terrible. Sometimes there are some things you can't fix with light. Uh, I was talking uh, a couple weeks ago uh, about how you create texture on stage, not only through gobos, which I use, obviously, but also just through thinking about the space in a three-dimensional way, okay? Thinking about how actors move through different types of light. So it could be angle, it could be color changes. It's layering the stage with light. Students, 
usually don't think about that. They think about light sort of in very two-dimensional ways, mm -hmm. uh, especially when they're working in proscenium. In, in a thrust, in, in, um, in black box, in our arena, yes, it's a three-dimensional space, really easy to see. But when you're dealing with proscenium, it's not. And let's be honest. 90% of the shows I do are proscenium shows, mm -hmm. maybe even 95%. And so I, you know, we have to create this space, you know, this depth, you know, through layering of lights. So you can actually create a texture of light as these actors go through different layers of light and you have really no patterns in there whatsoever. That was my point. And you could do it also through dynamic cueing where, the, and this is something that Theron used to do, which is she did it in chorus line. Matter of fact, for anyone who's ever seen the original lighting design of that, which, which uh, Ken recreated last year on Broadway, which I thought was another fabulous story, that that whole beginning song, which is I, what I think I got it, which I think was the song, is, mm -hmm. she uses amazing amount of layering as these dancers move up and down stage. And there's a yeah. whole sequence of cues at the end of that song where they go into the circle and they're handing out the resumes. You don't see it, but where the lighting has like moved from downstage to midstage and then they break out and they all go upstage against the periactoi, right? And all you see are shin kickers. And then as they're coming down, the layers of light just build, 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 build right until they hit the line. And then you have this bump cue and all this white light hitting them as they hold the resume pictures up. Mm -hmm. That sequence, which I found absolutely stunningly brilliant and really <laughs> something I live with to this day. And as a student, when she came to my school, I asked her, how did you come up with this? How did you come up with this series of six or seven cues? Right. And you know what her answer was? I watched at the rehearsal. <laughs> Right. Because she saw the layering. She saw it all there in the rehearsal room. Right. So she thought about lighting in a three dimensional world and creating those three dimensions. And that's how that's what I'm talking about, dude, creating texture within the three dimensional world. That doesn't mean you can't use gobos. Well, then she had the computer to do it, which gave her that. I think I think she probably had visions that she couldn't have gotten on manual. Precept. Yeah, absolutely. And David, is that what you were saying? Like you were saying about using intensity as different layers and things? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, again, this is stuff that I learned from watching her shows. Yeah. And, uh, and Ken, you know, and, you know, all these people who are fortunate enough to work with her. And I'm sure if Theron was alive today, she'd probably, you know, give credit to Jean, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not saying it's something that she came up with. All I know is that in my life, that's the first time I saw it. And when I saw that show on Broadway, when it first came out, it changed my life, mm. my whole lighting life, which is why Ken did what he did, which is why instead of taking this, Natasha's redesign, which I'm sure was brilliant, but like he said, she, she used movers, she used scrollers, he just went back to the original plot and the original focus charts and the original cues and why it was so marvelous because mm. it's there all using static fixtures. Well, I think the problem with gobos is that we see them uh, overused or poorly used. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it gets back to David saying, hey, put that leaf gobo on the giant wall upstage. So I, I, I think that's why directors are a little terrified of gobos is uh, people don't use them in a subtle way that Anne is talking about using right. them. And all of a sudden it just, it turns into kind of a mess and you're not quite sure what you're looking I at. I totally agree. Yeah, and I it, totally it, agree. And it's funny you mentioned uh, Theron's medallion. You know, Total Bastard Products sent me a Gobo medallion. It's Speedo on a fat guy, and I, <laughs> I, I, I wear that around my neck all I the time. I want one. That should be our swag. <laughs> I was thinking about um, creating texture without Gobos and ways that I do that in my own work, and I was thinking one of them is using the actual scenery, which is so great because it acts like a kookaloris if you've done – TV, that's a term that means gobo that's not in the light, basically. It's like something the light is shooting through. Yep. So I use scenery like a kookaloris or a sure. cookie sometimes. Yeah. So that's another great way to make uh, texture without gobos. And, you know, when a scenic designer gives you a gift like that, like use it. Steve has our last question of the day. 
It's George in Mississippi, and he writes, Can you suggest a couple of good books for my high school tech design class? Open source would be nice uh, to help me save money, as I would have to buy these books for my class. Well, there's two. Uh, I would recommend Theater Backstage from A to Z by Lunsford and Bollinger. And they wrote a companion book, Theater Lighting from A to Z. So again, Lungsford and Bollinger, you can get these used for $5. And if I had a room full of 13 and 14-year-olds who've never been in the theater (laughs) before, I think this would be a good way to start them off. You can also go to our webpage, and you can find these books listed on the resource page of our uh, website. There are a lot of books there. A lot of good books there. 53. Wow. Yeah, I was checking that out. We really have quite a nice little library selection, Steve. Thanks for doing all that. Uh, We we do have the Light Talk Presidential Library that is opening up in uh, Sanford, Florida. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, We're at the end of the show. Well, that Hammond Organ Solo tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. Check out our website at lighttalk.org for future guests. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Fun. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. And just remember, if you choose to litigate us, our law firm of Fleck, Flock, Flair, and Glare, and their paralegal snoot snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, San Clemente, Gainesville, and the Republic of Texas. And tune in next week when we discuss why bother with all these trade shows and conventions, are we failing in the classroom, and lighting designers gone wild! I thought that was this episode. All that and a new sponsor. Light Talk, broadcasting pretty questionable lumen knowledge and <laughs> humor around the world. <laughs> so we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye bye from Light Talk. Bye, bye everybody. Light Talk.